Before we dive into today's insightful discussion, I want to share some updates that will enhance your FemPower Health experience. We're excited to launch our new interactive newsletter. This weekly newsletter is packed with the latest scientific findings, business insights, and essential updates in the realm of women's health. Signing up is easy. Just visit our website or click the link in the show notes. Our website is also a comprehensive resource organized by topic for your convenience. Whether you're delving into the latest research, exploring any trends in healthcare, or seeking information in specific health topics, it's all there at your fingertips. Additionally, for our Spotify users, we've created playlists categorized by these topics, offering you another way to stay informed and engaged. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, while we can't categorize content within the app, our website remains a central hub for all of these resources. And be sure to take advantage of these tools to stay on top of the evolving world of women's health, science, and business. Now let's get started with today's episode. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. It's one of the most frequent causes for repeat surgery is incomplete surgery. Unrecognized or recognized but not treated due to the surgeon limitation and left and never mentioned aspect of of the surgery. This could be peritoneal disease, this could be ovarian surgery, this could be deep endometriosis surgery, this could be hysterectomy, this could be chest surgery. If you don't, if you leave tissue behind, the patient will come back. Endometriosis impacts at least one in 10 women. And many go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed for many, many years. So in today's episode, I'm bringing to you an abbreviated version of my top five all-time downloaded episode with Dr. Tamara Suchkin, a world-renowned surgeon for endometriosis. And this is clearly a popular topic on the podcast. So feel free to go to the webpage and type in endometriosis to learn more about other episodes with experts and patients alike. So now let's listen to Dr. Tamara Suchkin as he gets real about endometriosis. Even in medical school, I was in OBGYN ward since the third year or second year of my medical school. More than 25 years right now, I'm exclusively focused on this area. It has been a passion, obsession, addiction to this disease due to its uh, challenge and its um, being so complex. It was something like calling and inviting me to battle this along with the patient. Gradually increasing your ability to win more battles with the patient's help, you kind of feel like you can serve these waters. It's very exciting field to be in, actually. There's no cookbook recipe for an outcome of a good dish here. Every endometriosis is different. Every patient is different. Patient is different. Their disease is separately different. So there's a difference between the two concepts. And and you're a surgeon and you, you do the best you can. And I, I must disclose to the audience why I wanted to interview you. So I came to you after a three-year journey of being told I had unexplained infertility. 
and the late Dr. Braverman did tests on me. And he said, I think you have silent endometriosis because I had no symptoms. But I think also why I wanted to talk to you is not just because thank you for giving me my child, but with the with uh, Dr. Braverman, of course, but also I went to the Endometriosis Foundation of America conference, the 10 year anniversary in 2019. And the doctors that you brought together at that conference, it was just absolutely amazing to both have a day where the doctors all got to talk and then the patients got to hear the specialists as well. And it became clear there that there's only a handful of experts in the world who know endometriosis. And because of the training in medical school, a lot of the experts are self-taught. And you know, since this is such a complex disease, I thought, why not have someone who clearly understands this, already works with the experts around the world, and really help women understand more about the disease so that they know what to do. So thank you for making time with the over-zooming during COVID and your busy surgery schedule to be here and help educate the women. But just for those who are still getting to know endometriosis, maybe you could just briefly describe the disease and the complexity behind it. Endometriosis itself is an inflammation that is driven by estrogen sensitivity of the cells. And if these cells happen to be the cells of the endometrium that causes monthly periods and it's located outside the uterus, guess what? It is monthly, there's a stimulation of these cells outside the uterus and that monthly stimulation causes mini micro periods so-called, within the body that does not escape. That micro periods, small periods, mini periods that doesn't escape eventually causes inflammation because body wants to kick them out or eat them up and cannot have enough power to eat them up, but starts shooting them with, with uh, inflammatory, uh, inflammatory chemicals and bullets, let's say, How, and then leaves the residue war zone, which is called inflammatory war zone with collagen and fibrosis and more development of these tissues obviously progress. And these fibrosis eventually, every time there's fibrosis, there's nerve tissue around, new blood vessel formation, the inflammation. So these nerves get trapped within the inflammation and even a little lesion becomes a big source of pain. So. Bottom line is we, we brought this concept of inflammation and years later, people start talking about the endometriosis inflammation. Everybody defined endometriosis, as you can tell, the definition of endometriosis is simple. Presence of endometrial glands and stroma, endometrial cells outside the uterine cavity. That is not enough. Presence of them with inflammation is what really causes the symptom. So, Without inflammation, defining endometriosis as just cells out of the uterus is, is not adequate definition. It is the inflammation that is taken care of or excised along with the glands that you see that creates the better treatment, an ultimate treatment actually, that leads to tissue diagnosis and everything else we may talk later, but it is the inflammation. So inflammation and getting rid of inflammation, understanding inflammation is important because if you do not understand the disease, you cannot treat it. Even though we don't know how the disease formats, how does it start, but overall recognizing the tissue with problem and getting rid of it is, is the key. And inflammation is formats in different way, visual, there's visual recognition is different. It's not really pigmented black and black lesions or cherry colored lesion or of red colors that you see. Many of the endo lesions are not that color. They're white. <laughs> they are, uh, on, and under bright light, they are not easily detectable many times. That's why many times uh, endometriosis patients do not get treated adequately. In my practice later, I found out these women who had pain, as, I, as we discovered laparoscopy, trying to look inside, I mean, I always believed in what they, the patient said. I was really influenced or affected with the 
how smart woman was with bringing their their uh, their issues and uh, you know very open about their their issues and once we look uh, and it's hard not to believe them when they say they are pimping and you give certain medicine and you look inside later and you see endo then you realize what you were taught was not true and uh, that was really the calling and you it, you just attracted them you as you treat them as they feel better that you push forward and you do more and more and more and suddenly i found myself in this uh, land of very complicated cases and with my background of very heavy surgical background with vascular surgery breast surgery this that i was a surgically oriented guy i mean i basically went in and i took care of things then if you really follow you know microsurgery is the ultimate surgical precision you no know, um, techniques you can get the best result today the ophthalmologic surgeon eye surgeons and brain surgeon and ultra plastic surgeon techniques are all based on microsurgical principles in gynecology also at that time uh, the most important aspect of fertility was treated by tubal surgery so tubal surgery was done under microscope and we would go for every little capillary all these things together really put me here today talking to you does everyone need laparoscopic surgery first of all the symptoms of endometriosis is, is also one of the symptoms is no symptom which was me <laughs> okay but the only symptom become becomes fertility issues right uh, the prevalence of these patients we do not know but i think it is vast incredibly yes. large and that's why we really do not know exact prevalence of endometriosis we may know the incidence which is during when you attempt to do things to cor- to go inside for any surgical procedure you see endometriosis or when people have symptoms you go in you see this much of endometriosis so that incidence is around 6 to 12% maybe there's also some group patient who get pregnant or some infertile patients never get doctor's attention so there is that group over yeah. there in the corner we have no idea who they are you know one of the things that a lot of the reproductive endocrinologists have talked about is they don't really evidence shows that um endometriosis doesn't necessarily impact fertility and as a result they tend to not necessarily feel the need to recommend laparoscopic surgery in most cases. I do think um in the American Society for Reproductive Medicine findings they do say if you have late stage that you should get the laparoscopic surgery, but a lot of the REI say well the data showed early on that it's not necessary. So it's it's really interesting to see all these professionals disagreeing, which is why I wanted to bring you on because I think women need to understand there is major disagreement the way doctors are trained it's not enough and we really have to fight so i think just helping women understand all these things from your expertise is, is so important today let me just just clarify something who needs surgery first yep. of all it's important to underline the fact that i never tell anyone they need surgery i want patient to tell me they want surgery they are the one who lives with pain they are the one who i am with them for 15 to one hour consult twice or three times prior they decide to go forward uh but it is their the life that they, they live within with their loved one w- within that family they're from if it's in, impacting on their daily functions impacting the, to their happiness impacting to their uh, uh productivity uh, from school or to to job well obviously something needs to be done it's important that how they their symptoms are so pronounced in some patients and they're made to believe it's normal is mind blowing and it comes with sometimes certain cultures imposes that does mother daughter relationships are so crucial and sometimes uh, the type of uh, ambitious personality of the, some women uh, really they have a way of blocking their symptoms to while their their disease are uh, really so extensive that they have nowhere they're pinned against the wall and then they say let's have let me have surgery but i think that's why awareness is important if women recognizes certain symptoms of endometriosis 
what we know as IBS. Let me just clarify. When it comes to IB endometriosis, IBS is BS. It's the biggest BS. Many women sucked into that concept of IBS, not realizing or not being recognized that their symptoms flaring up with periods never brought to attention of anyone. So any symptom of IBS, I call this ergus, okay? Endometriosis-related bowel symptoms, all right? Which, which are they? Constipation, diarrhea, cramp, bloating, gas, you name it. Those, those group of symptoms, if they are flaring up with period and they're progressively getting worse, it's almost, uh, almost diagnostic clinically, presumptive diagnostic signs from the symptoms that you can say that this is mostly endometriosis because awareness of symptoms we're talking, awareness of some painful periods that are gradually getting worse and not responding to non-steroidal pain medication. Let's not get to narcotics, non-steroidal pain medication. Pain during deep intimacy with deep penetration, deep contact progressively or later showing up in, in symptom chronology. And this bowel symptoms popping out or from the get-go is three cardinal elements of endometriosis uh, symptoms that we need to make public and doctors aware. And these are not easy subject, confidential, pain, uh, (laughs) shame-producing issues that people don't want to bring bring up. You know, they... even doctors are preconditioned for that. They don't really ask the question. Let's help the women figure out what, what they can do. And I think, you know. So awareness, I think we were at awareness. Yep. Awareness mm-hmm. is the key. Early diagnosis and awareness. That's why I, in a meeting in Croatia in 1993, I was with Lona Hummelshoy, the, the president of endometriosis organization, right? how early diagnosis is the best prevention of and detection is the is the only way to to halt the disease and to move forward i think and only with awareness you can bring that early diagnosis and and prevention issue right and endometriosis is really really a disease you can diagnose early and you can prevent the disease jump from one stage to another and you really can prevent a lot of every bad things that happens to endometriosis patients, whether they lead infertility or hysterectomy or losing an organ or bowel obstruction. Many of these things could possibly very well prevent it, knowing from my ex- example of my patient population. Is prevention always getting surgery? Like, for example, you know, you take someone like me who was asymptomatic endometriosis was never brought up. I'm well-educated. I've been in the biopharmaceutical industry. I am a chemistry major. I didn't really know anything about endometriosis until much, much later in even my fertility journey, which was in my mid to late thirties. And now obviously with social media, there's a lot more awareness, but again, if you don't know to go on social media about endo, you may not find it. So how does someone no, I get diagnosed because right now, again, the diagnosis is the laparoscopic surgery. And if someone is in their early stages, then it's harder to find out through an in-office exam, which even in those cases, endometriosis is missed. So how can someone get diagnosed early? Are these the patients who have that severe pain at a young age and you know they should have the right to fight for the right treatment? Well, well first of all, probably... Uh... Right now, speaking, I mean, time is changing. So that's true. Many g- girls know their p- mother's history. First of all, if there is in the family history of uh, history, of, his mother has endometriosis, or aunt, or sister, or someone. So there is a very high chance that you may be in that pool. So that's one part. Even though there's no symptoms, one has to bear in mind they they have they need to that part of awareness number one. And symptoms, many times, uh, women, if women, we teach women that certain symptoms of even painful period, with a little bit of everything that I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be very severe, but if they're dancing together, they're all three of them around, but if they're not sexually active, significant bowel symptoms with painful period and laterality, one side, this, 
even though they are normalized, so-called normalcy is being pushed by doctor or or their um, even mother or uh, no, don't worry, I have it too. Don't worry, it's going to be. But self-awareness is is a key. They don't have to be very severe. So we need we could really recognize certain things without panicking. I mean, you know, and and uh, that that one we're talking about the symptomatic group right now. And uh, how can a woman woman know? I mean, awareness is is becoming another you know serious it's a part of education. So that's why in foundation we started this high school education to young girls and boys too, because a man can recognize things in, in a relationship that women may not even want to bring bring. In doctor's perspective, if you don't need a laparoscopy to call somebody with very high certainty they have endometriosis. Uh, in my population, out of 100 cases I do, I don't have more than two patients, three patients a year. That's one out of 100 if I, in my population that I go in and don't see any single endometriosis. Okay? Wow. Completely. However, there are type of endometriosis that in some women, it is massive. In some women, it's one or two lesions. So let's roll the tape back. It's easy to diagnose endometriosis by uh, when they have image findings, like on sonogram, you see the cyst, or MRI, you see bowel nodule, or da-da-da. That's, that's what, why they say, they refer to the doctors, when they say 50% endometriosis, they're talking about endometrioma, when there is cyst, all right? Endometrioma is an end stage of endometriosis. When the ovary gets a cyst, chocolate cyst, it's already, the thing has been cooking there for years. Peritoneal endometriosis, how it starts. And for that, there's no biomarker. For that, there's no image studies. When you look at everything normal. So you're complaining about pain, lady, but everything is negative. Sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. However, if you really ask the right questions to that lady, about their, their period synchronology or their uh, period and their symptomatology of that comes along with the period. If you ask the right question, the answers will start popping up. And she, most of the time, they have been imposed as normal things for that woman. They think, they assume it's normal. It's normal to have pain with period. It's not normal to have pain with period. I mean, anything more than one day, and doesn't respond. Second day pain, third day pain is not normal. Pain should subside after the flow starts. When the flow starts, the pain should also go down. And if the pain is continuing after the flow and staying and lateralizing right side, left side, ooh, that means something. You got to ask the question in a very fragmented microscopic format, the pain, all right? After the periods of, is the pain still there, all right? How is the bleeding? How bad is the bleeding? Tampon plus tampon are very minimal. Tampon tam plus tampon means a lot. And those women have significant pain. So where is the pain? So you get, is it uterine pain or out of uterus pain? Uterine pains is crampy, midline. Women know what central pain is. They know it's there in general. I mean, but right. when the pain is on the side, that means this is the same pain after the period starts, pain still continues. Also, we have pain with ovulation. Why? Because if there's endo around, ovulation is very painful. And it's lateral, it's one side consistently. That's, that shows that there's something there. And also the presence of GI symptoms like nauseousness, like general bloat, like endo belly they describe, right? The patients say endo it, I feel bloated, I feel terrible, I feel and it, all those things with GI, GI is a terrible feeling with GI symptoms. So that is all endo-related symptomatology. So a doctor, if they are aware, I'm talking through you to all these GI doctors particularly because they really get these patients and they are the least informed people on endometriosis. And you know what? When doctors, GYN doctor doesn't know or doesn't have the courage to push forward to a diagnosis and they start sending to the patient on the wrong path. It's like you're directing a train instead of going to Washington, suddenly you change the, um, 
the switch the shelter, the, the, the patient ends up in Nevada, in Las Vegas. That, right. That's kind of thing, and never comes back. Anyway, so, so awareness uh, from the doctor's angle, these things, you don't need an invasive laparoscopic surgery to have an idea, strong suspicion, strong presumptive diagnosis of endometriosis. The real scientific diagnosis and the real, in other words, evidence of the crime or the pathology is when you see it under microscope, not even laparoscopy. The real evidence is under microscope. FemPower Health is pleased to partner with the upcoming FemTech and Consumer Innovation Summit. The summit is the latest deep dive event, part of the Women's Health Innovation Series, looking to tackle this growing sector of women's health, having had continental success in driving innovation, investment, research, and partnerships in traditional women's health care by bringing together critical stakeholders. Join us in New York on June 7th and 8th as we channel this success into the consumer sector of women's health. Visit www.femtechconsumerinnovation.com to view the superstar speaker lineup and enter code FEMPOWER15 for 15% off your ticket. Hope to see you there. You know. and, and just to add to what you're saying for those who may not fully understand, so endometriosis can grow in a lot of parts of the body and just going to and correct me in, in how I'm saying this, but you know, because it could go in the bowel, et cetera, like OBGYNs aren't necessarily trained in all of these different parts of the body to do the surgery. And you want to make sure the patient is safe. So once they do the laparoscopy, because you may not always know where the endometriosis is growing until you're in, it's important to have available these other surgeons just in case they're needed, which I know is tough to say for someone who doesn't live in a city like New York, where that's easy to get. Um, but the reality is it's important. And I hope that people who are listening to Dr. Seshkin can see like how hard and complicated this disease is and it's worth doing the surgery right should the surgery be needed. You know, I've, I've read so much about all these things you can do with your diet and, you know, removing toxins from your daily life are really, really helpful with managing the inflammation. At what point does surgery play more of an important role? Like, is it as simple as if someone is in earlier stages and not as much pain and they start managing it through diet and other things and their symptoms subside, that's enough? Um, is it always that surgery is needed? And then if the surgery is there and if it's the right surgeon, can endo come back? With the right education and by like this support system that pushes for all non-surgical management techniques from diet, exercise, and understanding inflammation and it's it's and the toxin. And I mean inflammation and toxins are similar concepts actually. Right. Inflammation is internal toxins, right? Inflammatory molecules are toxins, not friendly to material. That comes out and doesn't that systemic effect of endometriosis, that fatigue that is not feeling right, that's headache, that's you name it, that's that inflammation, the effect of inflammation. So toxins are something that you ingest from outside and makes you feel lousy and da 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 da. So overall, before surgery, if that balanced issue with diet, exercise, and other support measures are formatted, I I like to uh, underline the the value of exercise because estrogens there's Cutishol estrogen, estrogen and adrenaline are related in a way that exercise, you can really eliminate excess estrogen. In other words, the endometrium is estrogen sensitive tissue. Okay. So exercise itself is a, such a regulatory effect on the overall estrogen is metabolized and organ uh, effect, whether it's your, the way you feel, the way you, your uterus uh, respond. So those elements are part of the success of surgery when the surgery is decided. Nothing will get rid of that endo away, even though you may take Lupron, the most powerful menopause drug, or, or, or Elisa birth. They may subside the symptoms, but it may not. So people can live with those symptoms with like birth control pills. Excellent. Excellent for a while. I mean, if they can manage the symptoms with it, even though it doesn't get rid of endometriosis, 
I mean, people will live a normal life and it can change. So you don't not need sur surgery. But the, when the decision comes, the b pain medication and birth control pill don't help and symptoms are still pronounced. When the surgery is necessary or in case of infertility, then like you were saying, the right surgery, what is the right surgery, who does the right surgery, what needs to be done right is a different, different thing. First, how does a woman know who the right surgeon is given there's no database? And by the way, um, there are databases, but I would say that those databases aren't enough, just given what I know about endo and women's health. So how does a woman know who to go to? First of all, let me clarify. OBGYNs are not trained as, as true pelvic surgeons, even though they are the most proximal doctors to do pelvic surgery. But in their four years of training, they are with all these focus on medical legal exposure hospital systems and, and emphasis on obstetrics. Half of the time, more than half of the three quarters of their time, even I would say more, even more, is focused on obstetrical aspect of OBGYN. Patients should understand these. So if a doctor is really doing obstetrics in their practice and they're doing your endometriosis surgery, that's the biggest red flag. Okay. Don't, don't do it, okay? okay? That's not the right person to do it. You can't, and, because, and on top of it, one really has to be honest about, and the patient have, should ask the right question. Hey, how many have you done last month? There are people who really do this quite frequently. There are people who don't do it frequently. And it's not easy to find these. But if you really want to find the right person, this is the second question. How many have you done last month, last year? And how many years have you been doing? The, the third thing is, is there a dedicated team with you? And who is your, who is the, who is your other surgeon team? Who is the leader of that? And I think the, the next question is transparency. Would you take pictures or would you record my surgery? That's very important. If the surgeon is, does not hesitate to do that, that's two thumbs up. I record all my cases. Not that I know because I know I'm not perfect. So if patient comes with, with two years later with pain, I, my record, even my own record that I dictated does not tell me everything in my professional experience. I go back to the tape. I think patients should have second opinion and, and uh, we need to get organized also to give them more empowerment to mm -hmm. express themselves and, and educate them. These principle of clarity or transparency and truthfulness to the patient is important, but the patient has to dig that too. The patient has to ask that. If you don't ask the right question, you're not going to get the right answer. And you will know the opportunity whether someone is answering you truthfully or not. Tell us more about getting the repeat surgery? So there are three factors for repeat surgery. Okay. One is the patient, one is the doctor, one is the disease. These are three factors, but one is the most important factor is not the patient, is not the patient. One of the most important factor, it's the doctor. It's one of the most frequent cause for repeat surgery is incomplete surgery. Unrecognized or recognized, but not treated due to the surgeon limitation and left and never mentioned aspect of, of the surgery. This could be peritoneal disease. This could be ovarian surgery. This could be deep endometriosis surgery. This could be hysterectomy. This could be chest surgery. So if you don't, if you leave tissue behind, the patient will come back. You leave it behind a big, big chunk, the patient will come immediately. Also, but then pain does not, recurrence of pain does not mean endo is back either. Let me play devil's advocate. So since we don't know why endometriosis begins, how do we know that if you do the surgery and take all of it out, it still can't come back anyways? I can tell you, I know this much. Endometriosis never comes back in the area it is removed. I am talking from my own very self-critical personality and for my own observation. I have gone to many times, I mean, maybe I operate one and between one and 12, one and 10, one and 15, that ranges from year to year. But out of those patients, I go back and look. Okay. They come to me and I go back. Wherever I remove the endo, most of the time, I never see as much endo as I saw. If I get even 20 
suspected areas, or very few of them are positive. But what is prominent in those patients? There's fibrosis, there's scar tissue formation. And overall, that perception of scar tissue causing pain may evoke the same circuits of pain. I call that sometimes phantom endo. Okay. In the absence of finding so much endo in someone, that the same person going in and finding not no endo could be also characterized as a phantom endo or central pain, which has a lot of other components to it. You mentioned before about asking doctors how many surgeries they've done. A good endometriosis surgeon or one of the experts, how many would they do in a given day or year? My answer is you put it together the way it's supposed to put together. Who does this? This endosurgeon should do it. If you're calling someone else to do it, that person has nothing to do with it. That's where the trouble starts. Okay. Because many times you don't have a team, the doctor who comes in to fix things that for a deep endo doesn't know how to do things right and the complications starts from. That's why endo surgery gets a lot of bad rep and the doctors right. are afraid to do it. You okay. gotta fix your holes. The okay. holes, if you, and endo has no mercy to any organ. It will go through it, you gotta fix bladder. And you know what, the patient, has to know about it, but truthfully, recovery is fantastic. I mean, there's no, not, no issue on that. So it's the same thing as C-section repair. It's the same, so anything that you wound, you close, it's the same thing. When does a woman need a hysterectomy? Are there cases where they get them and they shouldn't have had them? I mean, this just breaks my heart and I really want women to know before they make such a hard decision. I, I think this is, this is a, the heart of the ethics of endometriosis practice where doctors feel that they can do anything which they believe or whatever rights in the text and they could justify, move ahead and do it. And uh, I am collecting these cases, hysterectomy on young women that comes to me. Unfortunately, these doctors are in some big Facebook groups. They are one of the prominent doctors in those groups. And it's hard to say, we can't really Ethically, though, it is very concerning. And uh, I mean, having a one woman, 20 surgeries until the age of 20, and the 20 surgery, last 10 is done by robotically, by the same surgeon, by the same surgeon. And then having hysterectomies done or ovaries being removed in the end, or one woman, because of the recommendation of one group taken from, let's say, from Boston or New York to someone else and getting hysterectomy done at the age of 19 is synonymous to any crime you can imagine. I don't want to name it. Standards have to be defined. And I think patients who practice removal of organs and too many repetitive surgeries, we have to agree among us what the standards are. When is a hysterectomy, from a medical perspective, the right choice? First, yeah, besides women's choice of uh, requesting, patients re requ may request. That is true. Some do, uh, yes. Some, some request, okay? They, out of sexual preference, out of personal feeling about their periods, even for birth control, with risk involved and with the right person, that's a different thing. But medically, in endometriosis, hysterectomy is indicated when there is, first of all, massive adhesions around the uterus. So in other words, every time uterus contracts, theoretically it pulls on every other organ. And no matter what you do, as long as the uterus is there, that is gonna happen. So that's one. Massive, massive, extensive adhesions, scar tissue. The second is adenomyosis, when endometrial tissue invades into the uterine muscle diffusely. When there is you know, co compounding pathology, well, what are they? Let's say fibroid uterus. Multiple fibroids, 20, 30 with endometriosis. You know, that's, that's something. You, you can't really save that uterus effectively. When there's other issues with uh, the endometrial, like hyperplasia, this, that, obviously there's other indications of comp compounding. But the trick is, hysterectomy is not necessarily removing the ovaries. Hysterectomy itself also not adequate, only itself alone, naked, is an incomplete procedure for endometriosis too, because endometriosis disease is outside the uterus. So you got to go outside the uterus and clean the mess and the mud out there to call it endometriosis-related hysterectomy. 
Anything yeah. short of cleaning the, the endo around is not the right treatment. So okay. I want to just add that too. Medical indications are mostly it's adenomyosis and fibroids. Besides that, obviously, there could be multiple polyp, you know, fam familial uh, other diseases that can compound the indication. Okay. But there has to be visible problem. There's a, a test out there. It's Receptiva DX. And they basically take a sample of your uterus, uterine lining, and they test for the BCL6. And the way they describe it is if it's positive, it's basically testing for inflammation. And it's more for women who are struggling with fertility and miscarriages. And if you test positive, then it, it's not saying you have endo, but it says you likely do. Whereas if you test negative, you don't have to be concerned, but it's much more around miscarriages and fertility. And just given, you know, you work so much with, with women and, and obviously you're an endo expert. I just wanted to get your take just so women have an idea from different, you know, experts on what to think about when it comes to something like this. Cause I think it's so valuable to finally have a diagnostic tool to provide information that doesn't necessarily require multi-thousand dollar surgeries. Well, which I'm not minimizing, by the way. I'm just saying, like, it's uh, good to have options. Well, uh, well, I, I think the uh, BCL-6 coming to as a diagnostic tool or guiding tool, I mean, of course, we know what BCL-6, it's an oncogene protein, basically, for it's a B lymphocyte-based antigen, which is equal to, defines the progesterone resistance. And many of these patients who have miscarriage they have endometrial bed is not soft enough. They don't receive and host the coming embryo conception enough uh, solid bed to implant. So what happens is the same tissue because endometriosis is originally endometrial related tissue, same tissue. We have an article coming on that. It's the same really clonally. It's the endometriosis and endometrium clonally similar tissues. So these tissues are also BCL6 presence also is, is a semi-diagnostic for endometriosis. In the case of particularly the group of silent endometriosis, it, is not, a, it is not a big deal for people who have symptoms. Right. But for people who miscarry, their symptoms are so minimal or normalized, they don't see it as a symptom, but repetitive miscarriages these women, and in my practice, I've been seeing them vastly lately. We're getting a lot of referrals with high BCL6 or over 1.5, 1.7 coming in with one or even one, one or two miscarriages, or even without, without miscarriage history. But some sign of endo, they may elect to go for yep. diagnosis and elimination of the inflammation because what that mean could mean many, many failed IVFs. In my opinion, it's an opening a door for so many women. So last question for you. What is your greatest hope when it comes to endometriosis? Wow, this is a big one. Um, <laughs> well, well I, I think realistically, getting some sort of standardized approach to, to the best treatment techniques in a methodical way that applies to women and with early diagnosis before the disease jump from a, in a peritoneal phase into an organ attacking phase. You cannot eliminate estrogen. Estrogen is part of life. This disease will be part of us, part of the modern woman's life. If we can find a way of early diagnosis and having tests that would, that like BCL6, BRCL6, in similar way, with early awakening and the public awareness, if we can manage this disease without surgery, finding that particular molecule that will not cut the effect of the estrogen will still be around, but only affect the endometrium, but not promote the endometriosis of inside, it will be a true bliss. And I think people are working on this stuff. Yes. People are working on it and we know who they are. But overall, at this stage, if people have unsuccessful surgeries, if their pain level are, are persisting after procedures, this and that, I don't think they should lose hope that disease is not curable and things like that. With good endometriosis, is highly treatable disease. 
with the right approach. And, and many of these women do get pregnant, have a normal life, and even pain-free pain and pain-tolerable life is ahead of them, enough to forget about endometriosis and not even talk about it afterwards. Thank you for tuning in to this discussion on the Fem Power Health podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to information that is referred to in this episode. And if you like this episode and found it timely and valuable, please take a moment to tell a friend or a colleague about Fem Power Health. And right after this episode is over, please think of one person who might find this episode helpful and tell them about it. And if your friend is new to podcasting, please show them how to subscribe to our show. And another way to support Fem Power Health Podcast is to leave a review where you listen to podcasts. And as a reminder, the information shared by Fem Power Health is not medical advice, but for information purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the Fem Power Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. See you next week. Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of Fem Power Health. No matter where you are in your journey, our website is brimming with content tailored to your specific topic of interest or life stage. Dive in and discover the resources and insights waiting for you. Your voice matters to us. And if you found value in this episode, please take a moment to write a review. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but it also helps others discover our podcast. By spreading the word, you're empowering women everywhere with the information they need to navigate their unique unique health journeys. And if this episode resonated with you, please don't keep it a secret. Share it with friends, loved ones, or anyone you believe would benefit from the information. Together, we can create a world where every woman feels supported, informed, and empowered. Remember, knowledge is power, and FemPower Health is here to guide you and support you in every step of the way. And as a reminder, the information shared by Fem Power Health is not medical advice, but for informational purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the Fem Power Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Until next time.